So this talk will be about the Vey conjectures for varieties of the finite fields. And in particular, I'll be talking about how Andre Vey came up with the Vey conjectures. Um, this is what he did in his paper, Number of Solutions of Equations in Finite Fields. So this talk will be a sort of overview of his paper. So first of all, we just recall that we have the zeta function of a curve can be defined like this. So it's sum of n m q to the minus n s over m, where n m is the number of solutions or number of points on the curve over um, the finite field of order q to the m. So the zeta function kind of encodes the number of solutions to some equation over various finite fields. And what they did is he noted that this definition makes perfect sense, not just for curves, which he had been studying, but for high dimensional varieties. And he calculated the zeta function explicitly for a firmer hypersurface. So this is a hypersurface defined by the equation A1 x1 to the r1 plus a n x n to the r n equal to zero. So these Fermat hypersurfaces are the um, almost the simplest non-trivial examples of high dimensional varieties. So, I mean, obviously you can write projective space as a high dimensional variety, but that turns out to be fairly um, easy and um, the, the Fermat hypersurfaces are the about the simplest examples of non-rational higher dimensional varieties. So they're a, they're a traditional test case. And what they did is he calculated the number of solutions to this curve over various finite fields. And what we're going to do is just do a slightly simplified special case of Vey's calculation, which will give the idea. So in particular, we're going to take Q to be P to be prime and we're going to take m to be one. And so we're just looking at finite fields of prime order. The case of prime power order is similar, but does have a few extra complications. Um, so, so how did they calculate the number of solutions? Well, the number of solutions to, um, this is to f1, x1 up to xn is congruent to zero mod p is given by one over p times the sum over all x1 up to xn mod p. And then we sum over x mod p of zeta to the x times f of x1 up to xn. Uh, th this zeta is not the zeta function, but a root of unity. So zeta to the p equals one. Zeta is complex, so it might be um, something like e to the 2 pi i over p. And why is this true? Well, um, if zeta is a piece root of 1, then the sum over all x of zeta to the kx is equal to p if k is congruent to naught mod p, and naught if k is not congruent to naught mod p. So we see that this sum here um, is equal to p if f x1 up to xn equals naught and naught otherwise. So, so this sum here just um, counts p for each um, solution of this equation. And so we divide by p in to get the number of solutions. Um, and now we can rewrite this as follows. First of all, um, we can take all the terms of x equal naught, which give us a term p to the n minus one. And then we have a sum over all x one up to x n um, mod p, and we sum over all x of the not equal to zero mod p of zeta to the x times f x one up to x n. So it should be one over p there. And uh, this is the sort of main term 
it's the sort of expected average number of solutions to this curve. And this, and, and, and this term here is a sort of small error. Well, we want to show it's small. It's, it's not really an error, but it's a, the difference between the what we would guess would be roughly the number of terms and the exact number of terms. So what we need to do is to find a way of evaluating this sum here. And um, first of all, we can simplify it a bit by writing it as, as a product. So what we want to do is to estimate sums like sum over x not equal zero, sum over all x one up to xn, from zeta to the x times a1 x1 to the r1 plus a n x n to the r n. Now I've swapped the sum over x and the sum over all the x i's because if you look at this thing here we can write it as a product from i equals 1 to n where we just sum over all the x i of zeta to the x a x i to the r i. So um, um, this um, reduces to evaluating sums of this form. And we notice that x a is not equal to zero because we're summing over non-zero x and a is non-zero. So um, what we need to do is to estimate sums of the form sum over y from zeta to the a y to the r because and that's what each of these, these terms is. Um, and this sum here is equal to sum over all z of zeta to the a z times the number of solutions um, of y to the r equals z, rather obviously. And the number of solutions is given as follows. First of all, it's p if z equals zero. Um, it's um, r p minus one if z is not zero and um, z is an rth power. And it's equal to zero if z is not equal to zero and z is not an rth power. And um, we're going to set this term here equal to d because we're going to use it in a moment. And um, so to evaluate this, we now want to recall something about Dirichlet characters. So we recall from number theory that a Dirichlet character is just a homomorphism from z modulo pz star the multiplicative group so this is order p minus one to c star and this is just a cyclic group of order p minus one so there are p minus one Dirichlet characters mod p um, and the Dirichlet characters form a base for the functions on z modulo pz star. In fact, they form an orthogonal base for a natural inner product. Um, in particular, um, one function we're going to look at is just the function giving the number of solutions to y to the r equals z. And we find the number of solutions to y to the r equals z is just a sum of um, D equals P minus one R Dirichlet characters. And in fact, it's, um, it's just those of order dividing um, the number D. Um, so um, that, that's fairly easy to check. So from this, we find that the sum over Y of zeta to the a y to the r, which is the sum we wanted to evaluate, is a sum of terms of the form um, sum over z of chi of z times zeta to the a z, where um, k 
Chai of Z is a Drishle character. Chai is a traditional letter for Drishle characters. So what we've done is we've reduced the problem of working out the number of solutions of the equation over finite field to the problem of working out these expressions here. So let's have a, have a look at these. Well, um, so what we have is a sort of sum over Z of, um, let's write this as chi of Z times um, zeta to the Z, where you remember chi is a Dirichlet character, and this Dirichlet character is just a homomorphism from FP star to the non-zero complex numbers, and this is just a homomorphism from the additive group of FP to the non-zero complex numbers. And these things are called Gauss sums. And what they really are, they're really just a sort of variation of a gamma function over a finite field. And to see this, let's write the formula for the gamma function. What's well, the integral from zero to infinity of t to the s minus one times e to the minus t times dt. And now the e to the minus t is just a homomorphism from the reals to the non-zero complex numbers. And the t to the s minus one is just a homomorphism from the non-zero real numbers to the complex numbers. So the, 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 the Dirichlet character sort of is an analog of, of, of just a power of t over the reals and the power of a root of unity is the analog of e to the minus t. And pretty much any formula involving the gamma function turns out to have an analog for these Gauss sums. Um, in particular, there's a famous formula for the gamma function if, if this is gamma of s. So there's a gamma of s times gamma one minus s is equal to pi over sine pi s. And we're going to find the analog of this formula for Gauss sums, which will tell us the absolute value of a Gauss sum. Um, so what's the absolute value of um, the sum of chi of z times zeta to the a z? Well, we just take this sum over z times chi of z zeta to the az and multiply it by its complex conjugate. So let's have a sum over y of zeta bar y of zeta to the minus a y. Um, we're going to take um, a not equal to zero, of course. We're also going to take chi, not the trivial character. So there's a trivial character, which is one everywhere. And we're going to assume it's not trivial. Um, and furthermore, we can simplify it a bit. We can just set a equal one by changing zeta to a different root of unity if we want. So this is now equal to sum over all y and z of chi z y to the minus one, because we notice that chi of z chi of y bar is equal to chi of z y to the minus one. And we have to multiply that by zeta to the z minus y. And now we change z to z times y. And we find this is a sum over y and z of chi of z times zeta to the z minus one times y. And incidentally, if you've seen a proof that gamma of s times gamma one minus s is pi over sine pi s. The proof is formally very similar to this proof here. Well, anyway, we can now evaluate this bit here because we're just summing this over all non-zero y. And this is equal to minus one if z is not equal to one and equal to p minus one if z equals one. And from this, we can easily evaluate this sum here and it becomes p minus sum over z not equal to zero of chi of z, which is equal to p if chi is not the trivial character. So we need to use the fact that chi is not the trivial character to say that this sum here is zero. 
So this gives the absolute value of the Gaussian sum. The absolute value is just the square root of P. Um, and um, now we can use this to estimate the number of solutions of our equation. So the number of solutions of a1 x1 to the r1 plus plus a n x n to the r n equals naught is now p to the n minus one plus some sum of terms, and each of these is a is a product of um, uh, n Gauss sums. So each of these terms has absolute value q to the n over 2. I guess that should be, that should be p to the n over 2. Um, so um, so um, this is equal to p to the n minus 1 plus an error, where the error has absolute value less than or equal to some constant times p to the n over 2. And you can, you can figure out an estimate for this constant. It's something like the product of the di minus 1. Um, in particular, um, suppose n is greater than or equal to 3 and p is large. Whatever large means, it means it must be significantly bigger than this constant. Then the number of solutions um, is um, at least one, so there are non-trivial solutions. So the number of solutions is now greater than one. I mean, there's an obvious solution where all the xi's are zero. Um, so uh, they did this calculation much more precisely and actually worked out to, um, um, he, he, he did everything rather more explicitly than the rather vague survey we've done here. And in particular, what he did was he looked at the, the following um, Fermat hypersurface. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm making all the exponents the same. And this is now homogeneous at degree r, so it is a variety in n dimensional projective space. And it has a zeta function, log of zeta. Um, um, log z of t is sum of n m times t to the m over m, where n m is the number of solutions over the finite field of order q to the m. So they did the case where m is bigger than one, which is slightly more complicated. And he found the following formula for the zeta function. Um, it's product of one minus alpha i t the plus or minus one, depending on whether the dimension is odd or even, divide by one minus t, one minus pt, all the way up to one minus p to the n t. I guess that should be a p. Um, and the, um, these exponents here are given by um, the product of Gauss sums, So the absolute value p to the n over 2. Um, so um, this is a special case of the formula they conjectured for all varieties, where he conjectured the zeta function was of the following form, p1 of t uh, times p3 of t, and so on times um, up to p. Um, um, 2 and minus 1 of t divided by p naught of t up to p 2 n of t. Um, so the special case of Fermat hypersurfaces, all these polynomials on the denominator have this particularly simple form, and the numerator, only one of these polynomials is non-zero. Um, so um, they then conjectured um, that not only did the zeta function of the following form, but all the roots of the pi's um, 
have absolute value um, p to the uh, minus i over two. So this is this is the Riemann hypothesis part of the Bayes conjectures. So what Bayes calculation of this amounts to is proving the Riemann hypothesis for the special case of Fermat hypersurfaces. Um, they also pointed out several other um, rather striking properties of this function. First of all, you can write the degree of these polynomials as uh, appears to be the Betty number of the corresponding complex variety. So for example, um, the, the degree of this factor here will be the middle Betty number of the Fermat hypersurface. Um, and um, they also um, conjectured things like the function equation for this function that we mentioned um, in the first lecture. Okay, I think that's all for Bayes' paper. Um,